My name is Rebecca Ellis. I'm the state director for Senator Welch. Um, this evening, we're going to have a listening session on econ economic opportunity and transformation. We'll be hearing from Senator Welch and our four panelists, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. And we will try to wrap up uh, no later than 6.45. So, without further ado, I will turn the program over to Senator Welch. Um, thank you very much. Where's my beer? <laughs> I had such a good time here a while ago. Uh, it was fantastic. Well, I better, I better wait until I behave, so I can behave a little bit. Thanks for asking. The beer here is great, as we all know. <laughs> and, you know it's, it's part of the transformation uh, of Winooski. I mean, you can't have a really cool city without really good beer, right? <laughs> so I want to I want to thank our host and all the servers here uh, for the fantastic work that you do, and it's really fun to be here. And I've been here before when you were serving uh, Peter's Pilsner. It was pretty uh, pretty tasty. Uh, so, thank you. But, you know, the other thing I want to say is it's just amazing uh, to see what progress uh, this uh, city has made. It's, it's really quite astonishing. I, you know, was in Congress for 16 years and made many stops here. Uh, Christine, you and I had uh, a number of press conferences and we, uh, and we did. And then everything that's happened at the school is quite astonishing. You know, how many languages are spoken at the school? Oh, we, they keep, we keep getting new ones, so. <laughs> well, but it's, you can imagine how much of a challenge that is. You know, these people, uh, young folks show up, they've got dreams, they're insecure, they don't even speak the language, and uh, you can imagine what the challenge is uh, to welcome those kids and to make them part of the community, and the Winiski School is doing it. So, I've just been so gratified over the years uh, to see the leadership in this town that uh, other, you know, it's just a huge challenge to have so many new people coming in, so much economic activity going on. How do you organize it? How do you get consensus among the citizens? Uh, how do you educate a very diverse uh, population? How do you create a sense of community? And everything that I'm seeing is that the leadership here uh, is, is accomplishing that. And you're becoming a model community. And it's so amazing to me uh, to drive in. Uh, and each time I come, it's different. And there's more good news going on. And construction is now beginning, right? Uh, just one of the things. But over the past several years, there's been over $100 million that's come in uh, to Winooski. And we'll hear a little bit about that. I think you've been amazing on your leadership. I know you really have. Let's hear it for this moment. So, you know, uh, one thing that's probably not known is how critical to the success of Winooski the, uh, the, 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 the Economic Development Agency has been of USDA, uh, and that is something you don't think of, that uh, the, the Department of Agriculture and the, and the wonderful work that Sarah does, uh, because you normally think that the Agriculture Department and the Economic Development uh, is just about agriculture, just about nutrition, and it is about agriculture, and it is about nutrition but it is also, also, also about economic development and making strong rural communities. And Winooski, we all think of as a city, it's densely populated, it's packed. But uh, the good news is that as big as Winooski is, what, 8,000? 8,000? That's smaller than like New York City. So it fits within the definition uh, for being eligible for consideration uh, for USDA, Depart uh, Department of Agriculture, Economic Development uh, uh, activity. And Sarah is here and is going to talk a little bit about that. Christine is. Uh, but it's a real reason why 
it is absolutely essential that we renew the five-year farm bill. You know, I serve on the Agriculture Committee. It's an extremely important committee uh, for agriculture, for nutrition, but also for economic development. And it is the agency that cares about rural America. And that includes small towns. And Winooski, by Vermont standards, is bigger than a lot of our towns, but it's a small town with big challenges. And that is why it's been great to work with Sarah at USDA in my role as the chair of the Rural, Develop uh, the Rural Development and Economic Development Subcommittee. Okay, so we are gonna be continuing our efforts to make certain that the Farm Bill does get renewed because it makes a real difference for what the economic development our opportunities are with those federal tools for Winooski to continue doing the great work that it's been doing with the great leadership it has. So I look forward to hearing from our panelists tonight and hearing your questions, but I do want to end where I began, and that is congratulations to Winooski for all that you've accomplished over the years and more is yet to come. Thank you very much. vision uh, for Winooski, which was developed a little before my time through a series of community engagement sessions um, by previous leaders, maybe during Deke's time. Um, and so those four key tenets, housing, infrastructure, having safe, healthy, connected people, and economic vitality, those are the things that residents said are important to them and that they want to see in the city that we are and are becoming. And We've been able to use those as the foundation for the city's master plan um, and all of the goals set for that eight-year guiding document. We have structured our um, policy work under that, that format. So we have policy advisory commissions in those different areas that the council can tap into additional residents um, for additional input as we develop related policies. And even our staff use that use those areas and the goals from the master plan that are aligned to kind of evaluate things that come forward as priorities. Um, I think it's also been a critical foundation for anyone new who's coming to leadership, coming to city council, to have a vision of you know, what our community has said they want to be when you maybe haven't had direct contact with all aspects of the community. So it continues to be our um, kind of the four key pillars of what we're working for. And I think is clearly still relevant today, like infrastructure, housing, economic vitality, having safe, healthy, connected people are the things that we keep hearing and keep seeing the need to be focused on. Thank you. Our next panelist is Sarah Waring, the USDA Rural Development Director for Vermont and New Hampshire. Sarah, USDA Rural Development has played a central role in much of the redevelopment work that is happening in Winooski. Can you talk about some of USDA's investment in Winooski and why the partnership between the city and USDA has been so successful? What are the lessons we can learn from that success? Sure. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And thank you, Senator Welch, for once again being able to have conversations with people in public settings all around the state. It's such an important thing to be able to do, to hear from folks and to be able to talk in an open dialogue. So we all appreciate you hosting these sessions. Uh, like Rebecca said, I work for USDA Rural Development. And USDA is huge, first of all. You think about USDA and you think about um, three squares, Vermont. You think about meat inspection. Maybe you think about wildfires. 
maybe you think about whether or not your um, your uh, local food hub is selling out of state and what kind of licenses they need to get. But there is an arm of USDA that is an amalgamation of the Farmers Home Administration and the funding that we used to give to our electric utilities and our railroads as they advanced westward across our country. And that arm is called Rural Development. The mission of rural development is to advance economic opportunity and improve the quality of life for rural communities. So that means we are actually an investor, right? We invest federal taxpayer dollars in small towns and small cities all over the country. And the way we do that is that we are focused on communities that cannot invest in themselves because they do not have the taxpayer base and they do not draw down private investment. So the federal government comes in to support those communities in building their infrastructure, building their business ecosystem, building their working landscape ecosystem, and building out essential community services and utilities by bringing money from across the country to invest in an individual place. So Winooski, as a quick example, <clears throat> is one of our most highly invested in small towns, cities, in the state of Vermont. Uh, the school expansion project is a project that actually caps the list for us in Vermont and New Hampshire as being the single biggest investment we have ever made in the history of our agency here at 57 years. Which is a phenomenal transformational project. And one of the things that we are always looking for is projects that will last into the future. Projects that will take a community from maybe a place of um, uh, resource loss, maybe a place of economic uh, stagnation, into a place of economic vitality. So I'm going to say this with the, I'm going to beg uh, forgiveness from your mayor, but feel free to think of my face when you're stuck in traffic on Main Street this summer and next summer and however long it takes. Because the other project that we invested in, and we did it both underground and above ground, is your Main Street revitalization. So the wastewater and stormwater, the burying of various electrical lines, and the streetscaping, that's a $20 million plus federal investment of taxpayer dollars. So between those two, we're at almost $80 million in the city of Winooski alone. What I I will save those applause and take them back to my staff, who actually did all the underwriting. Um, what I will say, and to answer the second half of Rebecca's question, what does it take to be able to invest in a community? It is really about, believe it or not, even though we have to check all the boxes for federal applications, which are quite long, it is really about trust. And that trust comes about because of transparency and communication and capacity. So one of the things that Winooski has that many of our small towns don't is an incredible leadership team and an incredible investment in your own town managers and city managers, your own elected officials, your city council, and the staff who you employ to be able to work with us on a daily, sometimes a daily basis to get through these applications and to get through the underwriting, the servicing, and the long-term commitment to paying back the federal government. I will say that one of the things that I think is really important as we look ahead is that rural development is designed really in three primary mission areas. Housing, which Deke is going to talk a little bit about. And for us, that's folks who are income eligible. And that's who we focus on first. Then it is also about infrastructure. And then finally, it's about rural business development. But what we know, looking across rural America today, is that no farm business model can stand on its own in Vermont and be 100% viable. No hospital business model can stand on its own in a rural community and be 100% viable. No childcare business model can stand on its own and be 100% viable. And it sure is hard as heck to build housing that can stand on its own and be economically viable. All of those things need to be designed and built together 
And that, I think, is really the next stage for where we all want to be looking as how those categories can be combined and how we can think cross-sectorally about economic viability and about success for a community. So with that, thank you. Our next speaker is Deep DeCaro, who currently serves as Executive Director of the Winooski Housing Authority. Deep, housing is called out as a key pillar in Winooski's strategic vision. Why is housing so important to the future success of Winooski, and how can federal housing programs help the city meet its goals? Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for the invitation. Um, Housing, uh, you know, obviously without housing, no one's going to be able to live uh, here, right, and work. Um, it's, the, it's the connector between all of the pieces and the, the product. So, uh, as Sarah just said, housing, transportation, health care, child care, we got to build it all together uh, if it's going to work. And so housing becomes uh, affordable housing, and I don't mean just affordable housing to subsidize, actual housing where people can afford to live here is critical to almost every piece. So we spent $58 million on a school, but if we can't keep kids here, you know, we, there, there's a huge question as to you know, where that investment goes. And if we don't have the housing and maintain that housing, that becomes a challenge. <coughs> so if, um, if we need a whole bunch of people to work, uh, especially frontline folks who are working as personal care attendants or custodians or food workers, and they can't afford to live here, um, and they have to live 30 miles away from here to find some place to, to, to live, then they have a real hard time keeping a job, right? Because transportation becomes a problem, and, and you know you get an old car, and you're trying to drive in the morning, and you can't make it to work, and then you find yourself losing your job. So what we're working on, and I hope to continue to work on, is to crack the nut about how post-COVID, when housing costs got from 100 and something a square foot to 250 or more a square foot, how do we build that and build that so everyone can afford to live here and stay here and walk to work and bike to work uh, and use the bike pass and use the schools? And that's the big crack and, I, and the, the nut to crack that we're working on. So housing um, is, is part of the puzzle. It's the critical part of the puzzle. And I'll give you just a couple little statistics on the way out of, of my comments. Um, maybe one is more uh, anecdotal. It's amazing how many people who require affordable housing, okay, and, and I don't mean even necessarily subsidized, but I mean, you know, are at 80% maybe of the area median income, you know, kind of almost average, are moving to Ohio and Pennsylvania because that's where they can afford to buy a house and live. Um, and that's huge, right? Because that's a huge brain drain, it's a huge labor drain, it's a huge enthusiasm drain, and it's a huge kid drain. Because those are the people who have kids. So, so that's the one thing. The other thing that's, for the federal government, that's really interesting, that's not in rural development, it's in housing, there's a huge amount of pressure on us to get out the housing vouchers. People can't find a place to live. You used to get a housing voucher even in 2019, and you know, within 30 to 60 days, you found a place, you rented up the place, and, and you lived there, and you moved in, you were fine. The voucher, where you could go find your own housing it used to be the gold standard. That's what everybody wanted. You know, you waited until you got that voucher and buy the GSM, then you had some stability in your life. That's no longer stable. We our success rate used to be 95%, it's now 20 to 25% of people who get vouchers who actually are able to find housing around here that they can afford to, to, to rent. When they do have vouchers, uh, just today, we're, we're getting calls. What happens? My landlord is selling and my rent's going up. And now all of a sudden, the rent is more than HUD will pay. And so therefore, I can't live there. Where can I live? There is some, there's some real stuff happening um, right on those lines that we have our, our numbers around. And our federal policy, you know, doesn't, for good reason, and maybe not so good reason, doesn't change very fast with the times, right? And you know we could potentially lose vouchers that if housing turns around, we won't have them anymore because we can't have people use them. 
So right now, from a federal government point of view, it's really two things in my mind. How do we build housing with four units or five units or six units? Because right now, the only thing that you can afford to build that's affordable is 20 units. In a place like Winooski, it's really hard to find land where you can build 20 units. Not only that, we don't want to live in a place where all the poor people live on one side of town and all the rich people live on the other side of town. That's not connected, right? That's not all of the safe, connected, and, and uh, affordable. And so do we really want to just have large tracts of land that are just poor people living in a particular development? Well, no. So how do we think about that when the policies are really set up for large developments of 20 plus units? We've got to, we've got to crack the nut on how to rehab housing that's four units, do a lot of infill with smaller number of units, and do it in a mixed way where people um, can talk to each other. One of the most frustrating things I had when I was city manager here was people were all living here but not relating to each other. And that's because they all lived in really different areas and they never got a chance to, to meet each other. And that's, that's all part of housing, it's zoning, it's all of the things about where people can live and where they can afford to live. And after our final speaker, we'll have time for questions and answers. And because it's a little hard to hear in this space, I encourage you to come up to this microphone to ask your questions. So um, feel free to start coming up now if you have a question. Our final uh, panelist is Wilbur Chavaria, the superintendent of schools for the Winooski School District. Wilbur, we've heard about USDA support for the new middle and high school. Why was that investment in your students so important? And what impact do you think it will have on the long-term success of the city? And what more would you like to see done? I like that last part. Um, well, I'll try to make you brief because you know I'm sure you're excited to ask questions. Um, the I think I would like to invite everybody here if you have not come over to visit us at the uh, middle high school that you just referred to. Please do because the question is answered very easily by being there. Um, you walk into the space that, that is so beautiful and it keeps getting beautiful because we keep putting up murals and artwork and, and plants. <laughs> and um, the, I always say that I believe that no matter who you are, where you come from, what age you are, you deserve dignity. And the place where our students spend most of their days nowadays is a place where they feel they have dignity, that like their their worth um, is, is appreciated. And so I could explain to you all the amazing things and the infrastructure, the architecture itself has done for learning and what we know about how little brains work. <laughs> but I think the biggest piece is just uh, knowing that students are safe, students are happy, Students uh, feel, as I said, respected. They don't feel like they are in a prison. They feel like they are in a learning space, in a community space, where they can see each other, interact, be creative, take risks, and just look forward to being a, a, in a space that is welcoming. And, and I think that's, that's why it was needed, because uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about the past, uh, but it was clearly needed. And I know that this will have a uh, positive uh, consequences for the near and, and long-term future for the students who are five-year-olds, four-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 17-year-olds, and for the rest of their lives. Uh, and what is needed, I, I could give you a laundry list of things that are needed. However, I think that that should take the back seat um, for now, uh, and first remind everybody that the things that we've achieved, the support that we've achieved, and everything that we, everything good that's happening to Winooski right now, we should not take it for granted, and we should not assume that everything will continue to be the same, and that our students and our families will continue to be respected, to be given that sense of dignity that they are being given in this moment. In the end, it's all politics. It's all the will of the collective 
and it's all who is control about who's controlling the narrative. And I honestly do not like when people say that they don't like politics, because this is not about whether you like it or not. As a person who's being victimized by the politics of others, I want to make sure that I am part of the conversation, and I want to make sure that we as a collective remember that what we got is not for granted, and we must protect it. So it's not about getting angry, but it's about appreciating what we've achieved, talking about how hard it has been to achieve what we've, what we've gotten, and thinking about how we protect it, and we ensure that we create a collective shield of carrying arms around our children to make sure it remains the same and it grows from there. So that, that would be my priority now. So we'll start questions and answers now. And when you come up to the mic, please um, state your name and also try to keep your question to one or two minutes so that we can have everybody who wants to ask a question and have the time to answer. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, taking our questions. So I have three things I'd like to take back to Washington. First of all, we need to cut government spending. We are running a $1.7 trillion deficit this year, on top of $34 trillion in, in, uh, in debt. In about two years, interest alone will consume more of our budget than the defense uh, department. That's just outrageous. Okay? Uh, we are running 100 miles an hour down an economic highway that says bridge out. And there is no, there's no solution, you know. And this is not a Democratic Republican thing. This is happening across multiple administrations. It's time to stop it. We must balance our budget. And taxes are not the answer. The average American family is paying what, 25 percent income tax, six percent Social Security, three and a half percent Medicare tax, state income tax, property tax, sales tax. All over 50 percent of your income is now going to the government. That's enough. And it's not about the billionaires, like Billy can tell you. You could take the entire net worth of every billionaire in this country, and it wouldn't solve this year's deficit. Okay, the answer is to cut spending. There's nothing that's uh, non-discretionary except our interest payments. Okay. Second is secure the border. What's happening is just unbelievable. Millions upon millions of illegal immigrants coming here, consuming housing, consuming medical care, our schools. It has to stop. We need to put pressure on Mexico who can stop this before they get to our border. We have huge economic leverage on Mexico, and we're not using it, okay? That needs to stop. And then we need to look at expediting the removal of those people who are dangerous and, and go back to their countries and apply illegally through the process to come here. And the third is to protect the Second Amendment, okay? Enough about legal government. What we need to do is enforce the laws on our books today. How many times on TV, Isabel, you see, you see these stories all the time? Guy's been arrested 27 times, and he's not in jail. Using a violent, you know, using a violent, uh, violent crime. That's got to stop. So I hope you take those back and share them with Becca and Bernie as well. Thank you. You know, uh, let me address that because those are all three valid concerns. And I'm in half agreement and half disagreement. Number one, the debt is a problem, okay? When you're in a fiscal emergency like we were with COVID, you do have to borrow money. But when you're in a time when the economy is improving and we've got the lowest unemployment, the highest stock market, then you can start paying down your debt. So I, I favor that. I favor probably more spending than you do, but I favor paying for what we spend, what we're spending on. All right? I've been a pay-as-you-go Democrat. And I think we've got to do, to do that. I do believe that the tax system is upside down. When you say how tough it is for everyday families, you're right, okay? Billionaires, I mean, Warren Buffett says it. He pays a lower tax rate than a chauffeur, all right? So that's just not right. It's not right. And so you and I may disagree on that. So revenues has to be part of it. Second, on the border, every country has to have a secure border. So we've got to work on that. We just had a vote. I voted for it. But you know what? We also need more legal immigration. We need legal, okay? Because the system we have right now is not fair to folks who are desperate and want to come and make a contribution to our country. It's not folks and the people who get here when they then don't have the capacity to work and it becomes an enormous burden on our cities and towns. So yes, a secure border, and yes, to more legal immigration. 
that's a balanced approach. It's become very politicized. That, you know, third, the Second Amendment, yes, we're all for the Second Amendment, but you know what, there is an incredible amount of gun violence, and we have to have gun safety legislation. So we may disagree on that, but I don't think there's anything incompatible with respecting the Second Amendment and honoring the rights that people have with having reasonable gun safety legislation. But thank you, thank you very much. And I will talk to Bernie and Beth. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I really appreciate all of the work that you do um, for the uh, quality of life in our state. Um, so my name is Lucas Peltier, and um, I live in Winooski currently. Um, I've lived in Winooski for a few years now, and I grew up in South Burlington, so this area is no stranger to me. I, I've seen it uh, definitely become more populated. It's a nice area. And so what I really would like to talk about is transit equity and how that affects both housing equity and educational equity. I'm not sure if you know this, but 100 years ago, the Winooski Bridge was designed for trams and trolleys. And as we know, the urban renewal projects of the 20th century led by Robert Moses out of New Haven, Connecticut and New York City design cities and design interstates to go through cities and intentionally block BIPOC communities from developing and forcing them to move. With that being said, the Vermont Area of Transportation, agent, sorry, Agency of Transportation's budget for the fiscal year of 2023 was over $400 million. And very little of that is being used for dedicated bus lanes or for proper rail transit. And although I love that we have access to the Amtrak in both Essex and in Burlington, it still leaves a lot to be desired. <coughs> so, transit equity. It provides an opportunity for people to live within, within rail corridors without needing a car and offering multimodal transportation options. I would just like to read you one quote from the National Association of City Transport Officials. It says, transit has the highest capacity for moving people in a constrained space. Where a single travel lane of private vehicle traffic on an urban street might move 600 to 1,600 people per hour, assuming one to two passengers per vehicle and 600 to 800 vehicles per hour, a dedicated bus lane can carry up to 8,000 passengers per hour, a transitway lane can serve up to 25,000 people per hour per travel direction. So my question is, what are we willing to do in the state and in Winooski itself to use federal funds from the bipartisan infrastructure law, from which there are five billion in urban area, I'm sorry, rural area formula grants for bolstering non-existent transit systems? What are we willing to do to improve the quality of life for people in this community and in this state? Thanks. I can start um, at the local level. We do spend a lot of time engaging our state legislators as well as the director of Green Mountain Transit, um, advocating for expansion or at least retention of services here. We have baked into our zoning regulations incentives to encourage private developers to add infrastructure that supports bus um, bike and other multimodal options. We do have some improvements coming via the bridge project in a few years and in the current Main Street project. Um, but my understanding is that, similar to what Sarah was sharing earlier, with the population density of our state, 
that public transit is not viable on its own, so it does require more public investment. Um, that is something that we are looking to the state to lead on. I don't know what the federal um, situation is there. Well, first of all, what I like about your, your point is, wouldn't it be better if we walked more, rode more, took a bus more, got out of our cars more? Wouldn't that be good? And we've got an upside down transit or a transportation system because it's been all cars all the time with the devastation you mentioned. Where I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts, the interstate separated downtown and the community neighborhoods from the Connecticut River. It was at a time when people didn't think about the river as anything other than a highway for sewage. All right, it's beautiful, the river. So we've got a long way to go, but I think the point you're making, I accept, and there are many of my colleagues in Congress that want to put more money into those alternatives that you're talking about. We've got a real tough time on public transit now. There was a significant infusion of money during COVID to help, up, help the transit systems because they didn't have ridership. Well, that money is drying up and the ridership is not going up. So it's a work in progress, but you make a, a, a very important uh, point from a health and community safety and community viability standpoint. Thank you. I'm Greg Watt from the neighboring shire of South Oregon. <laughs> I want to thank you, Senator, and the others for uh, joining us, picking this car. Um, I spent 45 years in agriculture and food industry, and I just kind of want to plant a seed tonight. Um, one of the last things I did, I was Special Advisor to the Minister of Agriculture of Kosovo, a brand new country at the time. I actually brought him to Vermont for a week, thanks to USDA. We toured Vermont to see small farmer projects, what the state might do. Kosovo is the same. But I also toured with him to Austria. The Austrians uh, showed him some interesting ideas that I think might be useful for Vermont. Austria invests in agriculture principally as part of its tourism model. Parts of the country are suitable for agriculture, but very much of it's the Alps. Like Vermont, not suitable for agriculture, really. I mean, like Vermont's not economically viable for most agricultural industries. They invested, they helped farmers turn their farmsteads into B&Bs. They subsidized them to sustain their agriculture, not to feed Austria, but for tourists to come and see things. Switzerland does the same thing. That's why you've got all the cows and the chalets and the Alps and all that. I think this is an interesting idea for Vermont because tourism is still a very interesting, viable model for Vermont, even if agriculture is mostly dead. So I just wanted to plant that seed for you to think about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a great point. And it's one of those things that I think our working landscapes are often missing as we define them, which is that diversification of business model. And tourism is one of those things that will help keep farm businesses viable over the long term. There are a couple challenges and a couple opportunities in that model. One challenge is that we have not classified our agricultural businesses as tourism businesses. They are classified in our federal government economic codes as agriculture and production. So what that means at a state level, right, is that when a farm becomes an event hosting site and they have 200 cars there for a wedding, do they or do they not have to get the Act 250 permit that the wedding venue down the road has to get? So there are some challenges we have to deal with at a state level, state permitting and state structuring of our agricultural businesses. But the other pieces really are coming at a federal level and some of those pieces relate to how we can drag down the costs for our agricultural businesses no matter what activity they're engaging in. One of the programs that the Inflation Reduction Act has incentivized is the Rural Energy for America program that allows for grants to go to farm businesses to lower their energy costs by doing renewable energy work or energy efficiency work. Now it doesn't matter what product they're making, it could really be 
for the wedding venue, right, that they're installing, but if they put solar panels on it, half of that project could be in grant form. So there is this sort of give and take between what a federal policy can do to incentivize diversified agriculture and what your state is going to have to do to make sure that those same investments can actually play out. The other thing that happens in Europe is the bio districts, which I think are a really interesting model for us to think about, especially given our flood resilience conversations that are happening right now. So, I'm just going to add that agriculture is really key. I mean, it, the, the farmers are the custodians of our landscape, uh, and it's so connected, as you mentioned, to tourism. But also, the farm to school programs are so important, gets our kids involved. The local food scene, like right here, a lot of Vermont products are used. And what I've seen in, in, with the restaurants, in uh, the bars that are, have opened up here in Winooski, by the way, you've got quite, you know, you can get a decent meal in Winooski. <laughs> and drink. But, that's the creative economy as well. And it is what helps us get through the day. We know we're going to be able to come to, to right here at the end of the day. So this is very, very important. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK. Um, my first concern regarding the agriculture. My first concern regarding the agriculture is we used to say there are more cows than people. Lately, it feels like we have more people than cows. In this unprecedented growth, it's not sustainable. It's something that is not, so there's a disconnect. Even further, it feels like you're spending 15 minutes at a red light when gas is $3.65 a gallon. I see everyone turning off their cars. Why are we doing this? And that comes to tech. Things like Uber, things like uh, DoorDash. I don't know if any of you know who Christopher Hitchens is. He's long since passed. He said, as a British citizen, if you ever find yourself in a surveillance state, leave. Don't pass go, leave beginning to feel like that. And I don't want to go into deep with this subject that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. But there is a surveillance state, and currently everyone who is their neighbor are dead or dying as we speak. We do not want to live like that. Secondly, the language of four people. When you're saying four people, think about that for a minute. There are a lot of people that are coming into our government. Yes, it's diverse, but they come from countries where class system is the order of the day. That means everything from untouchable to the highest echelon of society. Now, those people who are entering our government are now predominantly from countries that believe in that system. It's a British system. It's not okay. It's not okay to even say poor. How would you feel if I said untouchable? Look, there's one of our untouchables. How about we integrate them into society? We have to be careful of the people that we're bringing into government. They, they assimilate into our, we are created equal. So those are some of the things. Now, finally, I don't want to see a 2016 event where friends of those people win elections because the incoming group wants there to be that. They want there to be a despotic system, one in which surveillance of all of us is the order of the day. Your real estate and your farms will be taken from you. And if you think that it's happening half a world away and only to those people, you couldn't be more wrong. They will come after your property just as much as they will those people they don't discriminate. You know, the surveillance state with technology, with AI, that's a real issue where we have to make certain that we fight to preserve our privacy. So that is something that we have to watch very, very carefully. 
Uh, second, you know, we all, what, what you said about politics, we don't necessarily like it, but we're all part of it. So the definition of what our country will be with new people coming in, will it continue to look to the past where new people have helped us make a stronger country, where the new people have embraced the opportunity that traditionally has been available in America, which is getting out of reach for a lot of people. But you know, that's where I think you're exactly right. It's all up to us. You know, these freedoms that we have, this commitment to opportunity, you know, the commitment to hard work. Folks who come here or folks who are here and face real challenges, they just want to have the confidence that if they work really hard, it's not going to be easy. But they work real hard, they'll be half a step ahead tomorrow than they were today. So that's up to all of us. Hi, I'm Alex Messenger from Burlington, and I'm also a volunteer for the Vermont chapter of Citizens Vital Body. You mentioned the Farm Bill at the outset of your talk, Senator Welch. And, uh, Within the Farm Bill is $20 billion for climate smart agriculture and forestry practices. I've personally spoken with three different farmers in Vermont who are having a hard time making that transition. And I'd like to hear you say a little bit about uh, your support for preserving those parts of the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is very contentious. And one of the reasons it's contentious is because there are significant funds that are available to our farmers for adopting conservation practices and a, quote, uh, smart agriculture that's going to improve soil health, it's going to reduce carbon emissions, and over time increase crop yields. That sounds pretty good. Uh, a lot of my colleagues in Washington think that's pretty bad. And what they prefer to have is nothing to do, and this is the battle that's occurring right now in the House, not so much in the Senate, but there is a significant number of uh, my Republican colleagues, frankly, who want to eliminate any of the farm programs that could be improving our climate. That's a battle, because we got those provisions in partly with the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, we're standing firm on that. You know, I believe that agriculture, and, and Sarah, maybe you can speak to this as well, can be a contributor to the challenge we have in bringing down carbon emissions, not a cause of it. So I will defend those programs, not just for the climate, but for the benefit of our farmers who feel really great when they can feed America and when they can have better soil practices, more effective farming practices. Sarah, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, thanks for the question. I'll just add, not only were there billions of dollars, right, for the Climate Smart uh, Ag and Forestry programs, there were also billions of dollars for our electric utilities, right? So agriculture is a major contributor to climate change, but so is residential growth, so is commercial growth, so is transportation. So the other thing that the Inflation Reduction Act did was to incentivize electric utilities to build renewable generation stations and to build diversified and microgrid systems so that we can balance the agricultural load with our residential and commercial load and in many cases our transportation. So the incentivization of EV charging stations and building those out or of microgrids with renewable energy generation is, all, is happening at the same time. The Inflation Reduction Act unfortunately is not going to come around again probably in my lifetime, right? But it is a critical moment for that investment in our electric utility structure so that the technologies exist to be able to continue to bring online those kinds of generation and sourcing. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, what I would say is it has, it has been well balanced. The challenge, of course, is that like many of these issues we're talking about, it's often an economy of scale issue whether it is the individuals who can't get on the bus because there are only two riders on the bus and it doesn't pan out economically, or whether it's an individual farmer who cannot afford to make those investments, even with grant dollars, right? And that is part of the challenge, is driving those barriers to entry 
lower than they are right now. And I think that's a big piece of what our delegation always tries to do is to make those federal programs easier and simpler to access, uh, which I think is really important going forward. Thank you. So we, we're going to take three more questions and then wrap it up. So. Well, I'm Ernest Caswell, uh, commonly known as uh, Foster. It's a hard question. Um, um, but anyway, um, we need to bring people together, and we need to bring down barriers. We're in the city of Wolofsky. In the city of Wolofsky, depends on people bringing Wolofsky food. Everybody involved in food needs a home closer to where they live. Um, they don't live in the They live closer to where they work. My mother always described me as a farmer, farm worker who works for a farmer, not necessarily. Um, did I say that right? I'm a farm worker who works for a farmer, but many farm workers are actually farmers. Certainly could be and should be. And we need each and every person on the ground to bring us the food because Vermont produces about a third of what it of its population we have to depend on outside sources. And if we utilize all that land to grow that food closer to that. And how we do that is breaking down barriers, coming together, and recognizing our farm worker. And it's past due, we have to build homes for them. And we have to acknowledge our farmers out there working hard every day, bringing Manusi and Burlington. Burlington has a population of uh, 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 less than 60,000 and in the farm to plate now work there's 61,000 working on over 11,000 establishments bringing food to the great state of Vermont and beyond. So we have to move forward and build homes where our food is grown. Thank you and I know you've been working on a farm for decades, right? Yes, sir. And thank you for all that labor, all that incredible work you've done over the years. The hardest working guy in the room right here. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Ken Albert uh, from Shelburne. And uh, I, I think what the initial talk about uh, the economic development here going on in Winooski is that I think a really positive example of the proper kind of economic policy. But if you go to all the polling nationally in this country, uh, the people in charge right now are doing a terrible job. The Democrats just are doing a terrible job with the economy. And most people are crediting the Republicans as the party that, that really is good for the economy. And I, I think that's because what most Americans hear is in sense, in continual talk about how bad the economy is, how bad the people doing, uh, basically managing the economic policy are. And I, I think my concern is it's a dire, dire danger to this republic that I believe the Democrats are basically leaving all the dialogue both to urban and to rural people to those that are talking i think a grossly inaccurate description of what it is 
and until the Democrats basically decide to talk to all the people, not just the particular interest groups that they love to talk to, but everybody, even those people that don't care about some of those interest groups. Because if they don't get the votes, they will never have the elect electoral success that is needed. And so that's my great, great concern. Uh, one other, if I could just say something else. Uh, I'm from Shelburne and uh, talking about housing, we are now struggling with a major rezoning that will encourage, we hope, uh, more and more housing and we hope that housing means more and more affordable housing. And one of the reasons I bring that up is I'm also a farmer in Shelburne and uh, it is a struggle. Uh, we're basically a small state not with a large region of farming compared to the Midwest and parts of the West. So we need probably to remain viable, more and more mechanization, and also more and more people, because we can't hire the people for anything, any effort, it's, it's, it's very hard. And uh, one of the blessings we do have is when we do our harvest every fall, the crop has a harvest once once a year in the fall that we, that we farm. If we wouldn't have the refugees that mostly live here in Winooski, uh, our business just would not exist. Thank you. Ken, thank you. You know, Southern Vineyards, right? Stop by. Really good wine. You guys do a great job. I'm so glad you didn't get the freeze this year that you got last year. Yeah, but those are those are good comments. I'll just say this on the economy. We've got two economies. Um, you know, on one level, it's astonishing how many jobs have been created. All right? Uh, it's amazing how we've come out of COVID. But the reality for everyday folks who at the end of the month are trying to figure out how they're going to get their groceries to get them through the final week, uh, who've seen their rents go up, I mean, deep that. Uh, example you gave us, we had 90% success down about 25%. That's real. It's what's real for everybody. Uh, the gas prices, you know, they've come down some, but still, post-COVID, for lots of reasons, it's made it really tough on family budgets, and that's that's something we got to address. There's a lot of reasons for that. And some of it, by the way, is price gouging. I was on a call with Bernie. We're talking about the price folks have to pay for prescription drugs in this country is like four times anywhere else. So we've got to stay on that. But we've also got to acknowledge that even though the economy is good for some folks who've got a lot of assets in the stock market, most people don't. And most people show up and work hard and at the end of the week, at the end of the month, they're really trying to figure out how they're going to balance that paycheck. Thanks. Thanks. So before we go to our last question, I want to remind folks that Senator Welch will be hosting the Women's Economic Opportunity Conference. <laughs> this will be next Saturday, June 8th at Vermont State University's Randolph campus, and there's more information um, at the entry. Okay. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Paula Mutino, and I am a social worker specializing in trauma-informed care for youth and elders. I'm also a candidate for governor. And um, I see the way, as Bess O'Brien's beautiful film, Just Getting By, just encapsulates your point. And I'm a former farmhand turned social worker. Um, I wonder, so I applaud programs in Vermont like Head Start. I really believe and want to focus the rest of my career on preventative health, and uh, including starting an all ages community center in Barrie with so many rusty, turning rusty storefronts. They've been empty for so long. And um, what do you say in this rural forum about those thousands and thousands and thousands of Vermonters of all ages struggling with undiagnosed or diagnosed depression, dementia, anxiety, um, economically driven or world driven anxiety who are not getting seen even by a primary care, care physician or if they are, there's no psychiatrist 
even in their county who has patient time available, I think it's going to be 15 minutes. So how do we bring that funding into our state so that we prevent all of these things that trauma causes, which are chronic health issues, that will just cripple our workforce and make things harder and harder. It's like, it all starts with screening for trauma, and it's actually not that hip to fund that because it is a cost saving, it seems. I don't know, it almost seems like there's a conspiracy around why aren't we doing more to treat trauma. It, I think it should be a first issue, so thank you. Well, uh, you, you end with, uh, with not an easy question. Because the mental health challenges that people have uh, are really significant and expanding. And it's everything from folks who've experienced trauma, who are then made to feel invisible, and they're isolated and it gets worse, uh, to kids uh, who more than ever are thinking about suicide. And it's a lot related to social media. And you know, there's two approaches on this. One is to say we've got to have more mental health counselors available. I'm in favor of that, and I've voted for mental health parity, so that if you have health insurance, it has to include mental health as well. The funding is always a challenge. But you know, the other thing that I think is really, really, really important, and that is to create communities, which we're doing here in Winooski, because all of us are going to be lonely at times. Some of us, if we're lucky, we're not going to have the severe trauma that is so brutal uh, for anyone who's been who's been uh, subject to that. But you know, the day-to-day -day work of having a good school where if we went up there, we'd see kids with happy faces, where th lots they- of but Lots, lots of, of the, counselors in this room. And, and you've got counselors there. They've got a place to go to be seen. And what I see with folks who are isolated and get really depressed is they feel invisible. And that's why, again, there's an activism that each of us can have where we pay some attention to the people around us who need a little bit of a boost. So yes, with mental health counseling, but you know what? Which within our capacity is to try to create a community. And that's with businesses, like right here. This is a place people come to where they can kind of share frustrations, share hopes. I try to talk to what some of their issues are. So uh, everything that we can do to create a sense of community uh, is really, in my view, as important as counseling to create a sense of well-being. And by the way, all of us at some point along the way are going to have our challenges that just seem to be overwhelming. And if we're lucky, we have somebody who came along in our life at that moment and said, Peter, you know, hang in. You know, we'll be okay. And if you do, you pick yourself up and dust yourself off. But thanks for your advocacy and your sensitivity. And I want to, I, I really want to, you know, I, it's so wonderful to be in with this you know, Christine, you've been there, and you've got your own family, and you've got your own business. Uh, and Sarah, you're all over the place, and you're a born bred Vermonter and Geek. I remember being with you when you were town manager and always everybody here has so much hope for the community and now you're stepping in at this extraordinary school uh, that is such a symbol of, of hope uh, in the community and you know I gotta believe that this is what we need more of in this country you know a lot more we must be strong that's what I think so thank you all very much thank you everyone um, afterwards to mingle, so if you have more questions, please feel free to come up and speak with us.